When I first got into this field, uh, uh, on and off, um, almost 15 years ago, much more uh, in detail the last five years, um, that's all I wanted to look at as well. I can sort of shoot off the converter reactor. Oh, it's not exactly sexy enough. Uh, but converter reactors, even though they do require some extra fissile material per year, they really greatly simplify things and a lot of individual advantages. Now, the starting premise of this, this is Oak Ridge's work. Uh, late 70s, around 1980. They call it a 30-year once-through design as well. Uh, a gigawatt, a thousand megawatt output. Uh, it's the same basic core as the molten salt breed reactor, a very simple uh, tank of graphite. Uh, a larger core, I'll get back to that in a second. But you start off with low enriched uranium. You try to have it as high as enrichment as you can to be able to have as much thorium as you can. Uh, thorium always gives you better um, sort of neutron budget. Um, there's no salt processing whatsoever, a little bit of chemistry control, etc. cetera. Uh, but because you don't break even, you just add small amounts to low enriched uranium annually. It was designed, this is separate here, but it was designed to be a low power density core to give a full 30 years out of the graphite. Eight by eight meters, that used to scare me, that sounds so large, but you start looking at these next to boiling water reactor vessels, they're still pretty small. Uh, a lower starting fissile inventory, light water, about three and a half tons per gigawatt. And that can be pretty simply modified if we want even less at the expense of uranium utilization, we can do that. And they should not have a reactivity coefficient issue like the molten salt marine reactor. Uranium-238 actually helps you a lot here. They had a much stronger projected negative coefficient. Hold on now though, we're talking about using loaner uranium, but isn't that gonna hurt your co uh, conversion ratio, produce all sorts of transuranic waste and rely on natural uranium that's gonna run out? in a couple decades. Well, in a converter, compared to using, say, plutonium or U-233, um, which my colleagues from Japan will talk a bit more, that's been more the focus of the Fuji program, uh, low enriched uranium, you will need more of it, uh, but it's much cheaper and much more available. Uh, and talking about transuranic waste. Now, the inventory of the transuranics in the salt is actually comparable to the pure thorium U-233 breeder and all. I have to repeat that because most won't believe me here. It does get produced at a higher rate, but these designs typically had a bit of a softer spectrum, so the cross section is larger. When you look at equilibrium levels, if you're not throwing the stuff away, you're trying to recycle it, you get a few hundred kilograms in a pure cycle per gigawatt. You get maybe a ton in, um, in uh, the DMSR. Uh, and it can actually be superior in the amount of transuranics that can go to waste. We say we're recycling, and just like the fast breeder, folks that sometimes say, well, then we have none. You always have to plan in for a small amount of loss per year. Uh, and the DMSR only, if the process is only every 30 years, every 15 years, there's more to process, but there's, uh, uh, you're doing it much less frequently. And we will not run out of uranium, despite the claims of anti-nuclear communities saying we can't expand their uh, nuclear program or the breeder supporters, especially fast breeder uh, supporters. I could talk for a long time on this. Most of you sort of know this is the case. When we talk about thorium, there's no real reserves because they only look at the economics of what's economical and there's no use for thorium. With uranium, we only sort of, uh, we find enough for 30 years and then we don't look really much anymore. So there's plenty of uranium, but there is some uh, justification for saying we can run out of cheap uranium, which can really hurt light water reactors. Um, anything above $300 a kilogram starts to start to really pinch them but it does almost nothing to DMSR. I'll show that more later. Uh, now, getting into the operation, as I said, we don't process out the fission products. Of course, the, the volatile ones come out naturally as in any reactor, so that's great for safety. And xenon's one of the, it's the biggest by far neutron absorber. We don't have that issue. Uh, so the uranium, after the 30 years, or if we change that cycle, the uranium's pretty easy to move. We can maybe bring in equipment or, and or inspectors, et cetera, if we're worried about anything, but it's denatured. If we recycle that, our lifetime war drops even farther, and I'll show a slide in a second here. Hopefully, we would also recycle the transuranics. Back in the 70s, and they didn't really consider that much of an issue at Oak Ridge. Uh, we should do that now so we don't have anything going. And if we assume that same typical sort of 0.1% breeding processing loss, that's really just a kilogram of transuranic waste in 30 years. And that's as good or even better than the, the uh, pure cycle. Uh, and I'll even add a comment. This is maybe the only reactor you'll ever <laughs> sort of read about that can claim a, a net reduction in the Earth's radioactivity. 
Now that provide that the provision, of course, is that 300 year waiting period for the fission products. We have about the same waste as the pure cycle, but when you uh, enrich uranium and send that in your reactor, you're also enriching a lot of what, uranium 234, which is one of the nat it's a natural, very rare in uranium, but it's it's quite radioactive. It's from the decay chain of 234. We're concentrating on that as well with the 235, and we're burning that off, so we can actually get that bar below. So we can make that claim, which I don't think any other can. It's one of these bumper sticker expressions that we can maybe uh, work on. Now, showing you a quick graph, just showing uranium consumption levels, light water reactor. Uh, they, they always used to talk about lifetime, which includes your startup and then all your annual. Uh, 6,400 tons lifetime in 30 years at 75% capacity factor, et cetera. The annual ore, uh, annual ore costs at $50 a kilogram, kind of cheap uranium, eight and a half million. You look at your fuel costs, that includes enrichment and fabrication, you're up to about 40 million, which is still pretty good, 0.6 cents per kilowatt hour. You don't want that to creep up too hot, up much above that though. Uh, when you recycle ple plutonium in light water reactors, it doesn't benefit you that much in, your, uh, in resource utilization. Sodium butyr, oh wow, we're, we're only burning uh, uh, a couple tons of, of uranium a year, but you're going to need, how do you start that reactor up? If you start it up on U-235, and most of the papers you find, they'll talk about, well, plutonium is just too expensive to remove, and there's not that much of it. Uh, your 15 to 20 tons of 235, you need more of it than 230 plutonium. That's already a lifetime ore of 4,000 tons. Now, provided, of course, they can go on to breed, but it just shows you right at the start, it's a massive amount of, uh, of money and resources. DMS converter, about 1,800 tons. If we do that single uranium recycle, nothing else, uh, drops that down to about 1,000 tons. And uh, with cheap uranium, your fuel cycle cost is a tenth of a penny per kilogram, uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, including enrichment. So we can go up to ridiculous prices of uranium, up to $5,000 a kilogram, which will put light water reactors out of business, but have, well, by then it's starting to pinch uh, converter reactors, but $1,000 a kilogram, it's still a drop in the bucket. So we need to pay for that uranium and the enrichment. Uh, that, it, it, it's pretty hard to justify then fission product removal as being cheaper because can you, you does your capital costs and operating costs, can you really get it down to that tenth of a penny uh, per kilowatt price? Uh, these were developed to increase proliferation resistance. Uh, it's very hard to compare light water reactors and molten salt reactors. In general, they're so different pros and cons either way, but they really try to focus, well, what can we do here? Because there's no fuel processing ever required. We don't need the equipment there. Uh, the uranium is always denatured, so it's no sage weapons usable. Now there is more plutonium, not that much more. Uh, it's, a, it's a better quality than the pure cycle, but compared to light water reactors, and of course, uh, um, weapons grade, it's really poor. Like the, the plutonium that's in that salt, very hard to remove, and it's about three times the spontaneous fission rate of LWR PU and about five times the heat rate, okay? So it's debatable whether light water reactor plutonium is, is ever really usable uh, beyond sort of a fissile, a fissile weapon as they sort of uh, talk about. It would seem much more the case in this case. Uh, there's no way you can't, in these reactors, you can't sort of stick something in, take it out, everything gets dissolved. You can't put in uranium-238 and pull it out and pull out, everything is dissolved. Uh, now, if you really want to get into these bizarre theoretical, we can start talking Neptunium and the higher. We have ways around that. We can make these even more thermal spectrum so there's less in the entire reactor that would be less than what's needed for, for a weapon if you want to. But a lot of people are, don't, don't play that route. Uh, but we're getting all these other adv uh, advantages and we have this almost as a bonus of the extremely high proliferation resistance. Now, some of the things I've been working because they didn't really do much optimization of this is, well, we probably want to go to much longer than 30 year lifetime, of course, 60 years. Uh, we can either make the core a little larger and still get that not replacing the graphite. Um, shorter batch cycles, regardless of what you do to the graphite, going to shorter cycles is probably nice. Uh, the salt, even if we're sort of sending the salt to waste, ideally take the uranium out, that's simple and it's cost effective. There's a lot of value in there. If we do just you know, two 15 year cycles or four and 60 years, we can drop that annual use because the fission products aren't building up nearly as much down to probably 20 tons of uranium. Uh, we can really drop this down uh, even more like going to lower tails on the original, et cetera. Some other things I've been looking at, Oak Ridge always sort of had graphite pebble use as a sort of plan B. Uh, some reports really positive, some not quite as positive. 
Uh, but in this case, this might be a, a, an interesting use because uh, we can maybe go to higher density power, so we can just cycle out the pebbles. And these pebbles are not fuel containing, just simple things of graphite. Um, add some pyrolytic coatings, et cetera. Uh, something I propose here, this is an Oak Ridge drawing, but I've sort of modified things. They sometimes have uh, reflectors, and it's strange, reflectors actually hurt things in some. The neutronics are actually worse very often when you have a reflector. But if you just change their pebble boat design, instead of that being a reflector, you have cooling channels in there that are more volume of salt. That gives you that same ability to have an under-moderated outer zone that really can uh, uh, capture any kind of straight neutrons. Um, Moving on, a tank of salt, getting rid of graphite altogether. It's really hard to do, and I kind of play around, uh, switch back and forth whether I think that's promising or not. You can't do anything about the 238 resonances. You can't have any kind of heterogeneous structure here. Uh, you probably would need to go to a higher um, fissile density in that, but I, I shouldn't rule it out. Uh, very excited about alternate carrier salts. FLIB is expensive, not, not ridiculously expensive. We have to enrich the lithium. Uh, it produces tritium, both lithium and beryllium. Uh, so there's some interesting alternate carrier salts that, oh my God, well, there's gonna be so much more neutrons lost in sodium compared to lithium. It's really not that much. There's been a lot of studies that not in this particular design, but looked at alternate salts and your losses to the neutrons yeah. don't really go up that much. And these alternate salts, very cheap, don't produce uh, tritium, uh, maybe lower points, a lot of exciting advantages here. Um, and the annual, annual radium, uranium needs, in some might not even change at all because like the sodium rubidium fluoride salt, you can actually have a lot more uh, fissile in the, in the salt to sort of compensate for a few more. The other, and I, I shouldn't even say this at a thorium concept, the conference is, well, what if you remove thorium? Now, yes, that's going to, uh, before the tomatoes start flying here, uh, yes, that will lower your conversion ratio a bit. But when you really look at the numbers, it's not that much. And it has some interesting advantages. The neutron economy is not as good, but it's only sort of a fractional increase in the uranium needs, and we're already so amazing. You don't have to worry about protectinium. You don't have to worry about, well, don't have too high a power density, we lose too many neutrons. It's got its own proliferation issues. Uh, it's nice sort of getting rid of that. Um, and it's also, if we want to reuse uranium, so we might worry about too much 236 or 238 building up. It's much easier to re-enrich if we need to do that. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting debates on Kirk's site about uh, the need or not in the regular DMSR. In this, you would probably definitely need to re-enrich because we'd have to be adding a lot, but it's much easier to re-enrich because you don't have the 232 with all that radiation. So conclusion, the DMSR has numerous advantages over other proposed molten salt radioactive designs, especially in terms of how much R&D is needed and the technological uncertainty. Um, uh, and, but even more and out, even Oak Ridge only really briefly modeled these, so much more help is needed uh, to explore these options and the potential of these. So I hope uh, I think that's well. And it can be viewed as a sort of first generation molten salt reactor. But with how good these are looking, the more I look at them and others are looking at them, it might be all we can see. All right. right. Got a question, Dr. Sure. <laughs> At the end of the 20 or 30 years, um, do you reprocess with a plant that you build on the site or do you move the salt somewhere else? What do you do? I would say that uh, the uranium, removing the uranium and recycling, that's the big thing that's economically, you want to do it. All the transuranic, that's just sort of for heritage reasons, we don't want it going to waste. That, there's no, the transuranic, there's no rush to do that. We can let the salts cool down a lot longer. The uranium, we probably want to do it fairly quickly. So we can either send it off to a central facility. It's only low inert uranium, it's not really proliferation. I preferred the idea of, well, maybe just temporarily bringing in fluorination equipment with inspectors. Well, again, you know, don't really need the inspectors, um, but bringing it in, so. Any other questions? Uh, what are the possibilities for installation in a decommissioned traditional LWR and uh, consuming the waste that's on site currently. You would need to, uh, repeat the question? yeah, to repeat the question he's asking, well, what's the possibilities of siting it at an existing light water reactor? I'm not sure if you're talking about using the same steam generators or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, decommissioned 
Yeah, well, one thing is those are pretty horrible steam generators. They got wet steam and everything. We don't want those. We want coal plant steam generators that alter a supercritical steam if we go to steam. Um, I don't see much advantage with trying to site in a decommission. I suppose your property line, things like that, your containment building, it's much more than we need, so we might as well use it. That's Yeah, that's probably, I never really thought about that. The containment building alone would be pretty valuable. Uh, using the spent fuel, um, removing plutonium is very expensive. A lot of people, oh, they're going to give it to us for free. It's very expensive to do. When we're going to throw it right into a molten salt reactor, any design, it should be a lot cheaper. We can just fluorinate. There's all these different things. Um, so definitely we can we can use these or any molten salt design to get rid of transuranic waste from uh, light water and spent fuel. And one just related to that, how, how much scale up in the actual power plant's output could be made using the existing containment structure? In other words, That's how many more megawatts gigawatts could you actually squeeze into that's the thing? probably a good point because we don't have the driving forces we don't have to worry about steam buildup right. if we've got that huge volume that's a very good point Oak Ridge often look well it's we'll aim for gigawatt but this is a two gigawatt this is a four gigawatt it's just a bit of a bigger core there's plenty of space all the heat exchange equipment is so much smaller than traditional there's plenty of space I would imagine we probably go to like five gigawatt before we'd start to run out of space in there so that's just a rough guess <laughs> All right, uh, just to keep things on track, thank you very much.